Dysphagia due to problems in oral phase can occur in paralysis of 5th nerve, 7th nerve or 12th nerve because there will be problem in bolus formation itself since an adequate size of bolus should form for entry into the esophagus. Problems in pharyngeal phase can occur because of paralysis of 9th and 10th nerve because these are the ones which are carrying the impulses from the oropharynx and also bringing about the constriction of various muscles in the pharynx. But you see the oropharyngeal dysphagia is usually accompanied by other symptoms of paralysis of these nerves. So in oropharyngeal dysphagia, uh, if the problem is on oral phase, so bolus formation is difficult and uh, it can also lead to drooling. There may be problem with occlusion of the jaw. So it will lead to drooling of saliva. In pharyngeal, there may be nasal regurgitation because we have seen that uh, there will be closure of the nasopharynx in this phase. There may be coughing, repeated coughing uh, after food uh, because uh, the food uh, will enter into the air passages. Now, esophageal dysphagia may occur either due to narrowing of the lumen of esophagus, that is the structural problems in the esophagus, or it may be due to motor problems. That means the coordinated wave of peristalsis, initial uh, contraction and relaxation of the muscle is not taking properly. Now when there is narrowing of the esophagus, mostly it leads to dysphagia with solid folds. But the motor problems, the movement problems, it leads to dysphagia with both solid and liquid. As we've already told that peristalsis is essential for both movement of solid and liquid. Narrowing, the movement is normal. So liquid can pass but solid will have difficulty in uh, passing from esophagus to stomach. But as narrowing progresses, the lumen may become so small that even liquids may have problem of entering stomach. But there may be other problems also which may be associated with swallowing. Now suppose this lower esophageal sphincter either fails to relax that is in tonically contracted mode or it relaxes too often. So when lower esophageal sphincter fails to relax food will not be able to enter from esophagus to stomach and it will start accumulating in the esophagus. So slowly slowly esophagus will increase in size and it will lead to mega esophagus. So it is a condition known as achalasia. But if LES relaxes too often, it will lead to reflux of contents from stomach into the esophagus. So that is known as gastroesophageal reflux. Now this happens if uh, there is uh, too much volume of food in the stomach, uh, which many of you might have experienced. So reflux of uh, gastric contents occur in the esophagus. Or it also happens with the uh, consumption of too much tea, coffee, alcohol, nicotine. So all these things uh, lead to too often relaxation of lower esophageal sphincter. Now what will happen if there is problem with this coordinated peristaltic wave? So there is a condition known as diffuse esophageal spasm. In this condition, contractions are not followed by relaxation. Instead, there are multiple points of contractions so which is not happening in normal peristalsis. So this type of esophagus is known as corkscrew esophagus. So there is diffuse esophageal spasm and if we measure the pressures inside the esophagus so what we do is insert multiple sensors which go at uh, multiple points in the esophagus. So one sensor will be here, other sensor will be here, next sensor may come here. We'll see that at various points there is increased pressure. Wherever there is contraction, there will be increased pressure, which is not happening in case of normal peristalsis. Now next we know that the initial one third portion of esophagus is the striated muscle, skeletal muscle. That means myopathy is affecting skeletal muscles, disorders affecting neuromuscular junctions like myasthenia gravis can also cause dysphagia.